Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Night by, I think it's pronounced Eli Weisel, Eli Weasel, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm very sorry. And uh, this is basically a Holocaust survival memoir, so of course it's very deep, very dark, very touching. It's first in a book of, in a, in a trilogy as well, so there's also Dawn and Day, which I will be getting to soon. And I thought it was really well written and definitely worthy of being in the Penguin Classics range. And even in like the introductory essay, the author was talking about... You know, what right does he have to share his story when so many other people died? And then he kind of points out, but, you know, we need these testimonies, especially when you have things like Holocaust deniers and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to read the blurb here, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my flags. Born into a Jewish ghetto in Hungary, Eli Weiser was sent to the Nazi concentration camps at Auschwitz and Buchenwald as a child. This is his account of that atrocity, the ever-increasing horrors he endured, the loss of his family and his struggle to survive in a world that stripped him of humanity, dignity and faith. Describing in simple terms the tragic murder of a people from a survivor's perspective, Knight is among the most personal, intimate and poignant of all accounts of the Holocaust. A compelling consideration of the darkest side of human nature and the enduring power of hope, it remains one of the most important works of the 20th century. And it does live up to that and it's certainly, I can see why it's taught on school curriculums and stuff like that. Like, for example, here in this preface to this new translation, he's quite pessimistic about it all as well. He says, books no longer have the power they once did. Those who kept sal those who kept silent yesterday will remain silent tomorrow. And that's arguably more relevant now than even when, when he wrote this, uh, this preface. There are a lot of these moments where you get this feel of, uh, I don't know, the weight of one decision that you make can affect everything, you know? So, for example, let me read this a little bit. There are rumours, my father said, his voice breaking, that we are being taken somewhere in Hungary to work in the brick factories. It seems that here we are too close to the front. After a moment's silence, he added, each of us will be allowed to bring his personal belongings, a backpack, some food, a few items of clothing, nothing else. Again, heavy silence. Go and wait the neighbours, said my father. They must get ready. The shadows around me roused themselves as if from a deep sleep and left silently in every direction. But then we get to this bit. For a moment we remained alone. Suddenly Batia Reich, a relative who lived with us, entered the room. Someone is knocking at the sealed window, the one that faces outside. It was only after the war that I found out who had knocked that night. It was an inspector of the Hungarian police, a friend of my father's. Before we entered the ghetto, he had told us, don't worry, I'll warn you if there is danger. Had he been able to speak to us that night, we might still have been able to flee. But by the time we succeeded in opening the window, it was too late. There was nobody outside. And there are a few moments like this where just one small decision makes a huge impact on the future, I suppose. So moving on here, we get to... Uh, we were pulling into a station. Someone near a window read to us. Auschwitz. Nobody had ever heard that name. And it's quite chilling to think that at the time nobody had heard the name. And looking back on it now, you know, how notorious that name is. And then they get to the camp here, and then this happens, which must have been awful. So, uh, every few yards there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. Hand in hand we followed the throng. An SS came towards us, wielding a club. He commanded, men to the left, women to the right. Eight words spoken quietly, indifferently, without emotion. Eight simple, short words. Yet that was the moment when I left my mother. There was no time to think, and I already felt my father's hand press against mine. We were alone. In a fraction of a second, I could see my mother, my sisters, move to the right. Zipporah was holding mother's hand. I saw them walking farther and farther away. Mother was stroking my sister's blonde hair as if to protect her. And I walked on with my father, with the men. I didn't know that this was the moment in time and the place where I was leaving my mother and Zipporah forever. I kept walking, my father holding my hand. And indeed, I don't think we ever find out, at least in this book, what happened to them. I think this is, this is kind of crazy as well, especially if you knew who this man is, so... The wind of revolt died down. We continued to walk until we came to a crossroads. Standing in the middle of it was, though I didn't know it then, Dr. Mengele, the notorious Dr. Mengele. He looked like the typical SS officer, a cruel though not an intelligent face, complete with monocle. He was holding a conductor's baton and was surrounded by officers. The baton was moving constantly, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. And he's one of the doctors, I believe, who was famous for carrying out all these like, super inhumane experiments, particularly on things like twins and stuff. There's this sort of little beautiful passage here as well. I think this was actually mentioned in the introduction to. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, that turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. 
Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my god and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget those things, even were I condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Biggie's here, by the way. He says here, uh, as, they're, as they're in Auschwitz, he says, We continue to march between the barbed wire. At every step, white signs with black schools look down on us. The inscription, warning, danger of death. What irony. Was there here a single place where one was not in danger of death? And then they lie to this guy about whether his wife and kids are alive. And then uh, it says here, One evening he came to see us, his face radiant. A transport just arrived from Antwerp. I shall go to see them tomorrow. Surely they will have news. He left. We never saw him again. He had been given the news. The real news. Which is super sad, but you can see why you would do it as well. You know, you would be tempted to give someone hope if you could. There's a character here, Louis, a native of Holland, a well-known violinist. He complained that they would not let him play Beethoven. Jews were not allowed to play German music. It's crazy that they've, that level of thought has gone into the racism, you know? It's, cr it's madness. Then there's all this stuff about Eli's gold tooth. Basically, he has this gold tooth and obviously like the dentist at the camp tries to take it out and he manages to fake it by pretending to be ill. But then they have to take it out for something else to like keep themselves alive from this one guy who basically gets transferred straight away anyway. I think this is kind of, it gives you a feel for what it must have been like as well. The bell. It was already time to part, to go to bed. The bell regulated everything. It gave me orders and I executed them blindly. I hated that bell. Whenever I happened to dream of a better world, I imagined a universe without a bell. It's kind of crazy to think of, but, you know, it's that institutionalised thing. I'm sure prisoners get the same. Even school kids kind of learn to dread the bell, I suppose. There's a character here, one of the Jews, he says, I have more faith in Hitler than in anyone else. He alone has kept his promises, all his promises, to the Jewish people. And then they're moving out of Auschwitz, and he doesn't know whether to stay behind in the hospital, but he's worried they might just kill everybody in the hospital, or he could accompany his father as well, and so he decides to accompany his father on this like forced death march that kind of reminded me of the long, the long walk by Stephen King. He says here, After the war, I learned the fate of those who had remained at the infirmary. They were, quite simply, liberated by the Russians two days after the evacuation. So this is another one of those things where this tiny spur-of-the-moment decision on what to do had these huge, far-reaching effects. I think it's mad as well, just before they move out, uh, the, the Germans make them clean the camp, and he says, For the liberating army, let them know that here live men and not pigs. And then Weisel says, so we were men after all. So this is one of the paragraphs in particular which made me think of the long walk. The night was pitch black. From time to time, a shot exploded in the darkness. They had orders to shoot anyone who could not sustain the pace. Their fingers on the triggers, they did not deprive themselves of the pleasure. If one of us stopped for a second, a quick shot eliminated the filthy dog. As they're travelling, people like throw bread into wagons and people fight over it. And he says, years later, I witnessed a similar spectacle in Aden. Our ship's passengers amused themselves by throwing coins to the natives who dove to retrieve them. An elegant Parisian lady took great pleasure in this game. When I noticed two children desperately fighting in the water, one trying to strangle the other, I implored the lady, please don't throw any more coins. Why not, said she. I like to give to charity. Humans, everybody, humans. And then he manages to give his father some coffee and he says, I shall never forget the gratitude that shone in his eyes when he swallowed this beverage. The gratitude of a wounded animal. With those few mouthfuls of hot water, I had probably given him more satisfaction than during my entire childhood. I can imagine. Like, can you... Well, I mean, I'm sure, obviously, you, obviously you can't imagine what it would have been like to be in those conditions, but you know how good it is to have coffee after you haven't had it for a while and, and after going through something like that, you know? And then I think this is very telling as well, after the first American tank arrived at the gates of Buchenwald. Our first act as free men was to throw ourselves onto the provisions. That's all we thought about. No thought of revenge or of parents, only of bread. And even when we were no longer hungry, not one of us thought of revenge. The next few days, a few of the young men ran into Weimar to bring back some potatoes and clothes, and to sleep with girls, but still no trace of revenge. So yeah, I mean, thoroughly fascinating look into the Holocaust, and a very needed book, I think, especially these days. I think it's a good thing that this is taught in schools, not taught in schools where I'm from here in the UK, but I definitely think it's just the kind of book everyone should read. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5, just wow. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Night by Eli Weisel, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.